Welcome to the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network's webinar, Supportive and Integrative Approaches to Pancreatic Cancer. My name is Sheila Bott, and I'm the Manager of Scientific and Medical Affairs for the organization. At the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network, our goal is to give you hope through better resources so you can make informed decisions. Patient Central can provide free, personalized information on many topics, including pancreatic cancer specialists and treatment options. Contact Patient Central at 877-2-PANCAN or email patientcentral at pancan.org. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our webinar sponsors, AstraZeneca and Ibsen, and to thank our scientific and medical affairs industry members, AbbVie, Angiodynamics, AstraZeneca, Ibsen, Pfizer, Raphael Pharmaceuticals, Tempest, Trisalis, and Time. The webinar is scheduled for 60 minutes and includes a presentation followed by questions time permitting. The questions that are relevant to today's topic and more general in nature will be prioritized. If you have very specific questions, it would be best to address them directly with your healthcare provider. A recording of this presentation and the slides will be available under the educational events page at pancan.org. Now I'd like to introduce our presenter. Dr. Richard Lee is a medical oncologist and serves as the Director of Supportive and Integrative Oncology at the University Hospital's Seidman Cancer Center and is also the Director of the Case Center for Integrative Oncology. In these roles, he oversees the clinical research and educational programs related to supportive and integrative oncology. His research includes health services, research utilizing survey studies, exploring both patient and clinician perspectives about supportive and integrative services. He also has been exploring the anti-cancer activities of natural plants, specifically mistletoe and mushrooms, in order to develop new cancer treatments. Dr. Lee has ongoing clinical research evaluating the benefits of acupuncture and meditation. Dr. Lee, I will turn the presentation over to you. Thank you, Sheila. And I also want to thank Chris and the PanCan organization uh, for inviting me today. It's a real pleasure to be here and, and speaking with all of you. And uh, thank you for joining, taking time out of your day. So I'll be discussing the role of supportive integrative oncology, which is a kind of a broad topic and uh, you know, look at it, how it relates to pancreatic cancer. So the objectives will be to understand the terms that we use, supportive and palliative care, complementary alternative and integrative medicine, understand uh, how these areas can support you, as well as how to build your own personalized, comprehensive uh, approach to your own care. So the objectives, similar backgrounds, principles, Talk about what we're doing here at the Seidman Cancer Center, review the data, uh, published literature, and then think, talk about how we can help you create your own uh, plan. So the whole field of supportive care, often called palliative care, has been evolving over the last uh, few decades. And many organizations like the uh, World Health Organization, National Comprehensive Cancer Network, NCCN, Institute of Medicine have published uh, multiple uh, articles uh, around this topic showing how important this is to the field of cancer. And these guidelines have been evolving and improving over the last uh, several years. All these guidelines really focus on a couple key areas, one being it should be patient and family focused. Uh, there are four main components uh, to this care, physical, psychological, social, and spiritual. It really needs to be in collaboration with the cancer team. Other things to remember are it should be implemented early to help prevent as well as treat symptoms, offers a system of support, and should be there to help enhance the quality of life throughout the whole course of illness. Now when you think about the field of supportive care, supportive and palliative care, it's really evolved in terms of the clinical model. It originally was thought of in the early days as you had treatment and then you transitioned into palliative care. But more, you know, as it evolved, it realized, well, we can't just wait till treatment ends. You really need to start at the beginning. And then even more recently, people have been looking at it as kind of episodic and where you might have a higher need for palliative care or supportive care early on. And then as you go through treatment, you may not need as much and it may come and go. And then uh, for some patients who are able to be cured, eventually go into hospice, while others who are going into survivorship, 
these symptoms do not just generally just go away entirely, that they may have chronic symptoms as they go into survivorship. So there's still a need for supportive care overall. Now, when we think about integrative care, oftentimes uh, patients or my colleagues may kind of look at me funny and wonder what I'm doing in integrative oncology. And of course, there are a lot of different you know, things you find on the internet or books about the field. And I always like this uh, cartoon. Frank started to get a funny feeling that his doctor was a quack. Uh, because unfortunately, in the field of complementary alternative or integrative oncology, there's a lot of different perspectives and viewpoints. And so there is sometimes a lot of quackery going on. So I want to help you think about uh, this area of medicine and focus on those that have the most uh, evidence and science to help you. So when we think about complementary alternative medicine, uh, this is a term that was first used in the uh, 1990s. And the National Institutes of Health actually developed the Office's Office of Alternative Medicine. Then later on, it was uh, renamed the Center for Complementary Alternative Medicine. And then most recently has been renamed the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. So you can see over time, the terminology has evolved as the science and understanding of the field has evolved. In general, we think of complementary or integrative medicine as those approaches develop outside of the mainstream Western or conventional medicine. Now, there's multiple categories that have been uh, looked at. So main categories are really natural products, so like those herbs or supplements, uh, mind-body interventions like meditation, and then you have those body-based or manipulative ones like massage, and then uh, kind of other categories, which include whole medical systems like traditional Chinese medicine or Ayurvedic medicine, energy therapies, and others. So when we think about the terminology alternative and complementary, um, I want you to go ahead and think for a moment, are they really the same? Are they different? And then how do we differentiate that from integrative medicine? So generally, when we think about alternative medicine, it's used in place of conventional medicine. So for instance, I have an interest in acupuncture. Uh, I have patients who say, well, I'm going to use acupuncture to treat my cancer. I would say, well, then that's an alternative approach to their care, where they're not receiving surgery, chemotherapy, or radiation, but choosing acupuncture. I have some patients who say, well, I'm going to treat my um, pancreatic cancer with chemotherapy and acupuncture. So that might be a complementary approach. So but really, integrative medicine is a little bit different in, in terms of how we look at it as compared to alternative and complementary. Now, there is an academic consortium for integrative medicine and health, which has over 50 academic centers, uh, even internationally now. And it has four main components to the de definition of integrative medicine. One, it should reaffirm the relationship between the patient and practitioner focuses on the whole person, should be informed by evidence, and makes use of all appropriate therapeutic approaches, providers, and disciplines to achieve ultimate health and healing. So I really like this definition. Uh, I think the key components here should be informed by evidence and make use of all appropriate therapeutic approaches and therapies. So not every type of therapy is appropriate for each patient. Now, there's also been a comprehensive definition published uh, a couple years ago by Claudia Witt, thinking about integrative oncology. And so very similarly, it's patient-centered, evidence-based, or evidence-informed, and utilizes a variety of different approaches, mind-body, natural product, lifestyle modifications. And the aim is to really optimize health, quality of life, and clinical outcomes. So very similar uh, to the academic consortium. So in my own practice, so uh, you know, I'm a GI medical oncologist, and I focus on liver, but I also treat pancreatic cancer patients. So I have a lot of patients who say, no, Dr. Lee, I really uh, prefer an alternative to traditional chemotherapy, surgery, or radiation. Um, and they want an integrative approach. So really, you have to think about, well, how do we use an integrative approach to help the patient really become an active part of their own care? Uh, and so I think that's part of the goal, and that's what's talked about in the definition, is how do we empower patients uh, to be part of their treatment plan? So a lot of the patients I see, uh, these are some real examples I've, I've seen over the past decade. Uh, I had one patient who came to me saying, you know, I really want to work on my nutrition. And I said, hey, that's nutrition is a really important part of your care. And he pulled out this bag. And I said, oh, he said, well, this is my nutrition. Um, and he pulled out a variety of different supplements. And he let me actually, these bottles were empty. He let me keep the bag. Um, and so this is just an example of, of what some individuals think about as an integrative approach. Um, this is actually another uh, example of someone I met who uh, wanted to, again, pursue an he, he, what he called an integrative approach, and he had seen multiple practitioners, and he had a list of herbs and supplements he was taking. Uh, this is actually an exact copy. I was taking some notes. 
Uh, you can see that he had multiple types of you know, immune, uh, like uh, immune type mushroom products. He had a couple different types of curcumin. Um, and he had actually three pages of lists. This is his morning list. He had an afternoon list and an evening list. So he literally was taking hundreds of uh, tablets a day as part of his integrative approach to his cancer care. Um, so I think we have to be uh, careful about what we think about when we say uh, integrative care. Now, this is a survey actually we published uh, when I was down at MD Anderson for many years. And we surveyed patients why they wanted an integrative oncology consultation. So uh, about a third of patients said they wanted an integrative or holistic approach. About a third of patients um, came because they had questions about herbs or supplements. And then you can see a variety of other questions, either it be diet, overall health, or specific symptoms, ranging from pain, anxiety, sleep, neuropathy, uh, as you can see here on the list. So I think there's a lot of different reasons why patients may seek out these types of approaches. So, um, I think we have to think very carefully about the use of herbs and supplements uh, as any kind of uh, therapy that may not have a lot of science, we have to think about what are the potential risks. Uh, and we'll talk about some of the benefits as well, um, but is it uh, potentially going to interfere with your treatment? Uh, is it going to put the patient at harm? And is it going to put any strain between you and your cancer doctor? And as well, I do worry about, especially currently uh, with the COVID pandemic and the economic impact uh, these types of therapies uh, may have. And also, uh, the time and energy it may take to pursue some of these uh, types of treatments uh, that are being offered you know, around the world. So what I often tell patients is that, um, you know, especially when it comes to the, uh, herbs and supplements, that uh, just because it's natural doesn't necessarily mean it's safe. Um, this cartoon says it looks like he died of natural causes and he works at a supplement store. Um, but a lot of my patients say, well, you know, it's different than the chemotherapy I'm receiving. And so I often tell patients, is it really that different in terms of the urgent supplement or the treatment you might be receiving. On uh, this example, you know, what is really uh, a medicine and what is really a supplement? Uh, oftentimes it's really blurred um, and it's not so clear. And often, you know, many of the chemotherapies that we use today, even for uh, pancreatic cancer, actually are originally derived from plants. So these are just some common examples we use today. Um, many of you may have received arena tecan, which is part of uh, full fox uh, treatment. Uh, gemabraxane, abraxane is really a type of paclitaxel. So uh, a lot of these things we use today are actually derived from plants. So, uh, but you know, generally you don't consider them uh, a natural supplement uh, necessarily. And I often tell my patients that to me something natural really is something that's coming from the environment. And most of the compounds we see today that are sold you know, in a supplement store or sold online um, are really processed. So you know, we don't ever see pills growing on a tree. We may find an apple or you know, a banana or pears growing on a tree, but we don't see pills. And so, uh, Any time that something is manufactured, I really look at it as a process uh, product, and we have to think about those very carefully. Um, and, and over the past few years, there's growing data that some of these supplements can be uh, harmful. And so I saw this uh, walking through the airport going to a conference, and I saw this on the newsstand and, and picked up a copy. Um, but it really is uh, important to understand what's the difference between things that are FDA approved and things that are sold uh, as a supplement. Um, and so this is just one paper. I'm going to summarize it for you in the next slide here. So when you think about supplements, um, a lot of the information is variable. So the dosing, the quality, the safety is not regulated. We don't, may not know exactly how it works. And a lot of the information comes from historical use of the compound rather than based on clinical trials. So there's a lot of variability and unknowns when we think about herbs and supplements versus anything that might be prescribed. So I think those are important differences to really note. The other thing to remember is that because it's uh, you know not FDA approved, and of course the FDA has its own regulations and issues, um, but supplements when they're sold at the, your store, you get them online, are supposed to have a label that clearly indicates that it is a product that has not been evaluated. And so it's not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure, prevent disease. So uh, the label may tell you that it makes you smarter or detoxifies your kidneys or helps do different things, improve your memory. Uh, but if it hasn't been studied, it has to have a label, a disclaimer on the back that basically says, I can market it as such, but I, I'm not, you know, it's not intended to do some of the things they may be marketing. So you have to be cautious. So we have to keep in mind the levels of evidence. And, and so is this something that's uh, based on some historical data, uh, something that's been tested in the laboratory, maybe in mice, but, you know, hasn't been tested in any humans, versus something that has had a randomized controlled double-blind study to really understand what are their risks and benefits with the treatment. So we really want to focus on those types of data that are coming from uh, clinical trials rather than something that's being marketed and only tested in the laboratory 
uh, for both patient safety and efficacy. Now, one of the earliest examples of where a natural compound can actually be dangerous for cancer patients. So um, many of you may know of the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, so the Harvard Cancer Institute. It's named after a famous uh, um, hematologist named Sidney Farber, who was studying leukemia in the 1930s and 40s. And he actually published this paper in New England Journal of Medicine, where he uh, was one of the first compounds to put leukemia into remission at that time. And uh, leukemia in kids was uh, basically considered fatal. And he was able to put the leukemia in remission. Now, if you actually uh, look at this paper in the background, the reason he came up with this folic acid antagonist was that he actually gave folate supplementation to kids with leukemia because he thought they needed more nutritional folate. He thought maybe they were folate deficient, and that's why they were feeling uh, weak and fatigued. And what he found was that when you gave folate to a patient with leukemia, it actually made the leukemia grow faster. And when he made that observation, he realized, well, if folate supplementation causes the cancer to grow faster, maybe I should block folic acid metabolism. And that's why he came up with this antagonist, and it did work. It put it into remission. And things like methotrexate are still being used today in leukemia and other types of cancers. So the principle of this approach still applies to cancer treatment today, but it is actually based on giving folic acid supplementation. Um, so something to remember. Now, there have been other examples where we've given supplementation of basic vitamins like vitamin E or beta-carotene antioxidants where they actually increased risk rather than uh, preventing cancer or, or save lives. So this is an example of the beta-carotene study in lung cancer. And you can see here on the left-hand side, you'll see that uh, those who got the placebo pill had less cancer than those who got uh, beta-carotene. And then those who got uh, placebo actually had less deaths than those getting beta-carotene. So beta-carotene ended up causing more deaths and also caused more cancers as well as more heart attacks and strokes. It's not exactly clear why that was, but ultimately, uh, at the end of the day, it caused more harm to patients than, than the benefit. So you know, things like antioxidants are not recommended. Now, here's another example where they use antioxidants. Here is, again, beta-carotene and vitamin E. And they, here they were trying to reduce side effects from the radiation in head and neck cancer patients. But ultimately, when they looked at the study, uh, the dotted line is the placebo arm, and the solid line is the, head and neck, uh, is the uh, antioxidant uh, supplementation arm. And you can see, so the supplementation arm actually did worse. They had worse survival than those who took placebo. And it's, feel, it's felt that probably the antioxidants may have interfered with the radiation therapy. Um, and so that was pretty surprising, uh, of course, to those who were researching this. And this is a more recent paper. It just came out uh, last year, 2019, where they were looking at supplement use in a clinical trial of breast cancer patients. And essentially what they found, you can see that orange dotted line. Those patients who were using herbs and supplements tended to have worse overall survival than those who did not use them. So again, we've been finding a trend where over-supplementation may be harmful. Um, now, what are the other risks that we have to keep in mind? There could be serious side effects like kava kava can cause liver damage. Some of these supplements may be contaminated. And there can be drug-drug interactions. Uh, and this is an area of research uh, where I found that uh, the use of herbs and supplements during cancer treatment can increase your risk for uh, drug interactions. Now, you can see here are some case reports of green tea causing liver toxicity. I still have patients who uh, act actively are eating or ingesting apricot seeds, which is a poison. It does contain a cyanide-like compound. And I've had patients uh, end up in the ER or in a hospital uh, because they took too many. Uh, so you do have to be careful about some of these quote-unquote natural compounds because they can have real potential side effects. Now, here's an interesting study that was published several years ago where the uh, researchers actually went out to the store and bought several different supplements just from the local uh, uh, herb store. And you can see here what they did was they did uh, DNA testing of the supplements to figure out which supplements had authentic product per the label versus those that might have either contaminants, substitution, or filler. Uh, and you can see here it's only companies C and F that actually, oh, sorry, uh, G, that had 100% authentic product. But the other companies listed here um, either had a mix of authentic and product substitution, or in fact, some companies were not even making an authentic product. You can see here, E basically was 100% contaminants. Uh, D had product filler and product substitution. So uh, it's quite variable, uh, in part because the, these products are sold as supplements and not required to have quality assurance. So, 
Um, you do have to think about your source of your urban supplement carefully. Now, um, this is an interesting study from the group out of Memorial Sloan Kettering where they were looking at the mushroom extract and its effect on the immune system, which is something a lot of patients are uh, actively looking at. And what's interesting is you can see at different doses, the mushroom product may have different effects on the immune system. And what they actually showed uh, in another part of this paper was that some immune cells did get stimulated, but some immune cells actually got uh, immunosuppressed, uh, actually get uh, decreased their activity. So um, these compounds, I think, are very complex. And uh, even in our own research, uh, where we're looking at the mushroom compound in colon cancer, we have found that different compounds, even though they're all mushroom extracts, have different effects. And we've even seen at different doses, it can actually increase the growth in animal models versus decrease the growth at other doses. So uh, it's a very um, complex compound, and even dosing may have uh, variable effects, whether it might be helpful or potentially harmful. So uh, we have to look at these carefully. Now, I know uh, somebody had to ask a question um, yeah, about what are some natural products uh, that have been studied in pancreatic cancer. Now, the list of those that have been studied uh, in the laboratory is extensive, and there's you know, probably 100 or more. Um, but really wanted to focus on those compounds that actually have had clinical trials uh, of a higher quality that might be able to inform us. So I know that there have been uh, actual clinical trials, and I think there are ongoing clinical trials looking at curcumin, some phase one, phase two trials. Uh, one in particular was when uh, done at MD Anderson. It did show some biological activity, but the response rates were fairly low, probably less than 10%. Um, and so not a very robust response rate, but it appears that some patients may have a response. Um, mistletoe is something I'm also studying in the laboratory. Uh, there was a phase three, I think, done in Europe. Um, but it seemed to have very limited benefit. You can see here that those who got the mistletoe had an um, overall uh, survival of 4.8 months versus those who didn't have 2.7 months. So it appears to have some activity, but again, it seems pretty limited. Um, and lastly here, I often get questions about the Gonzales therapy, which was actually studied. Uh, they actually did a study of uh, this proteolytic enzyme therapy compared to uh, gemcitabine-based chemotherapy. Uh, and you can see that gemcitabine-based uh, chemotherapy did much better than uh, enzyme therapy. So the conclusion of the study was that uh, it was not recommended uh, compared to standard of care options seemed to be much more uh, effective. So um, my general, uh, general approach to these kind of compounds is I would consider them experimental. Uh, I think they're worth studying and investigating and may be a source of a new chemotherapy in the future. Um, but I generally do not recommend them especially for patients who are newly diagnosed or who have not had um, standard of care uh, options because the standard of care options are, are much better than generally these kind of investigational uh, herbal products. Now, now, there are instances for which it might be uh, reasonable to consider them, yes, but I think you have to talk to your oncologist to see when's the right time to consider some of these types of treatments. Uh, and remember, they do have their own side effects. These are not benign treatments that have real side effects. Uh, that you have to be monitored for carefully. So I, I just generally say caution uh, when trying to pursue these types of therapies and, and talk with your oncologist. Now, what are the other things you be, should be thinking about uh, when you're thinking about your integrative approach? Because to me, these are herbs and supplements is just one small component of integrative medicine or integrative oncology. So when we think about the biopsychosocial model, which has uh, been you know, pub first published in the 1970s, uh, really they talk about three or really four main components of the physical, social, psycho, and spiritual. And so uh, when I think about uh, cancer care today, as it evolves, you know, there are multiple components, radiation, surgery, chemo. Uh, for some patients with heme malignancies, we use stem cell transplant. Immune therapies are, of course, becoming very important. But we have to also support the patient. And so we talk about those three, uh, four dimensions. And so in the physical realm, uh, having nutrition, exercise, palliative care, physical therapy, uh, and the psychospiritual. Uh, psychiatry, psychology, chaplaincy, social work uh, in the social realm, navigator support groups. And integrative uh, medicine is really another piece of the puzzle for patients to consider in order to, come, uh, to build a comprehensive approach to their uh, cancer treatment. Um, now, this is a model that we've developed here over the last few years with our supportive integrative oncology program uh, in the Seidman Cancer Center. And we base it off the four main domains, uh, physical, psychological, social, and spiritual. And it's not that every patient needs every therapy listed, but these are the ways in which we can support a patient uh, throughout their cancer journey. And we, we work together, as you can see in the model. It's the patient at the center, so patient and family center. Then we have the core uh, conventional uh, treatment options. And then we have an outer ring, which is the supportive care services. So really trying to uh, bring that all together. 
Now, I think at the core of the physical domain is really thinking about uh, physical activity and nutrition. And this is a uh, document from the American Institute of Cancer Research. Um, and their, their website has a lot of information about nutrition and exercise as it pertains to uh, pancreatic cancer. You can see pancreatic cancer, although relatively smaller numbers, because it's not as common, it is thought to be uh, sensitive to these interventions, such as nutrition and exercise. Okay. Um, and obesity, just your physical health, is considered a major risk factor. Um, now, you can see in the United States over time, unfortunately, uh, the overall rates of obesity have been climbing. You can see here over the last few decades, um, and the most recent data I could pull from the CDC, uh, 2019. Now, what's interesting now is that um, before the map had up to greater than 30%. Now, this new map has uh, kind of this orange color uh, or light red color greater than 30, 35, and then dark red is greater than 35%. So um, you can see it continues, the trend is continuing that um, as, a, as a nation, we're starting, uh, our, our physical health is declining as a whole. Now, uh, there's been studies looking at uh, obesity as a risk factor for different cancers and mortality. You can see this is a, here, pancreatic cancer for men uh, it increases a, a risk factor 2.6 times higher than um, a person who's of normal uh, body mass index. And even for women, it's around 2.7. So both for men and women, uh, the risk factor is uh, more than double in terms of mortality rate. Um, and there have been studies showing that if you follow the American Cancer Guidelines, Cancer Society Guidelines, and I'll, I'll go over those in a, in a few more slides, that you can reduce your risk both among men and women, uh, whether you smoke or don't smoke. Uh, and so these are some additional studies just looking at risk factors. Um, you can see again here obesity is the one, two, three, four, fifth kind of risk factor here uh, for, for pancreatic cancer. And these are additional studies. I'm uh, just showing there. So there's a general consensus that it is a significant risk factor. Now, physical activity can also modulate your risk factor. So the more physical activity you're doing, it can actually decrease your risk. So uh, again, showing it in the other direction. Uh, this is the metabolic syndrome. So it's uh, related to um, obesity as well, weight, so distribution, and diabetes and such. Uh, and so additional data here. So the trend is pretty clear. Uh, and so what can we do about your physical health? So uh, I think it's important to follow the American Cancer Society guidelines for uh, cancer prevention and cancer survivorship. So it's really focused on healthy body weights, uh, so knowing your body mass index, exercising regularly, so 150, 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity or 75 minutes of vigorous activity, so if you're actually running instead of a, a, a fast walk, uh, getting enough fruits and vegetables, avoiding processed foods like processed red meat, um, uh, processed meats in general, and refined grains, and then limiting alcohol. And of course, uh, not smoking. Uh, these are all the key factors. So, and there have been studies that even after treatment, you can see here that a simple exercise, this is a walking program, uh, can improve your quality of life in areas of fatigue, pain, and physical symptoms. And this is a, just another study where they were doing, uh, I think it was resistance training uh, for patients. And what's interesting here, you can see they actually did a, compared to a supervised uh, exercise program versus a home-based exercise program, and the home-based exercise program seemed to have the best effects overall, although both were helpful. Um, you know, so just doing simple exercises on your own at home uh, is probably uh, going to have a lot of benefit uh, for all patients. So let's talk about some of the common symptoms that uh, patients run into. So uh, I should say that my other background, so I'm a GI medical oncologist, but I also have uh, I'm board certified in, in palliative care. Uh, and so I see a lot of patients for symptom management, supportive integrative questions. And so, of course, pain and pancreatic cancer is one of the most common things we run into. And, you know, I, I tell patients that, you know, pain is really complicated. It's not just having pain, but the pain can be influenced by so many different factors, whether you're having stress, depression, uh, are you well supported at home, your cultural background. Uh, these call all influence how a patient feels pain. And so, you know, there's this concept we, uh, in palliative care, we call symptom cluster. And so in, for pancreatic cancer patients, I think uh, the common cluster I tend to see is pain, fatigue, gastrointestinal issues like nausea, vomiting, and psychological distress. So um, this is something that we all have to be aware of and try to address to help you have optimal care. Now, um, many of you may be aware that the pancreas uh, here in the abdomen, this little um, schematic here, is very close to what we call the celiac plexus. Now, the celiac plexus, um, as the cancer grows, 
the cancer can invade into the celiac plexus, which is part of your nervous system in the abdomen, in the, in the gut. And if it evades into the celiac plexus, you tend to have a lot of pain, which is more a different type of pain uh, than if you were, you know, you know, were to have a fracture in your arm. Uh, we call that more neuropathic. And so it's important to consider a neuropathic pain medicine. So that's something I often see has been overlooked. They are not on a neuropathic pain medicine. Uh, that might be something like uh, gabapentin um, or um, duloxetine. And oftentimes, um, I see patients who are waiting too long to get their pain addressed. So uh, if you're not able to do your daily activities or you can't get a full night of sleep because of pain, ask your uh, cancer team to help you with the pain management. Um, now, sometimes if patients are not, uh, not well controlled with medicines, we may need to do something called a celiac plexus block, where they can go in and inject something into those nerve areas uh, and actually block the nerve uh, function so that you have some pain relief. So that's something uh, that might be uh, something of value if you're having uh, really persistent refractory pain. Now, in the area of the GI symptoms, you know, that can range from nausea, vomiting, a poor appetite. And I think it's really important to not discount the importance of uh, staying uh, proactive about your uh, symptoms. So, uh, again, I have patients who uh, they come to my clinic and they say, oh, Dr. Lee, I had a lot of nausea, vomiting. And I say, well, uh, did you take any of your, your medicines that you were given to prevent the nausea and vomiting? No, no, I decided I wanted to hold out. So I tell patients, don't hold out uh, and wait till you're vomiting. Be proactive. If you have symptoms, it's best to address them uh, while they're early in the symptoms rather than waiting until they're severe. Uh, You've got to stay hydrated. And another key area that I often see overlooked is, uh, I think it's underdiagnosed, the pancreatic insufficiency. So your, your pancreas is not working, or maybe you've had it removed. And oftentimes, I see people who are fatigued, losing weight, and they're just not on enough pancreatic enzymes. So make sure to work with your dietitian to uh, assure that you're getting enough digestion of your food to you so you can absorb it and really get all the nutrients that you need in your diet. So, and of course, fatigue can be related to any of the symptoms we talked about before. You know, they may be malnourished, you're not getting enough sleep because maybe you have pain, uh, maybe you're having a lot of stress. Uh, so these can all correlate together, and that's why we call them the symptom cluster. So it's good to have you bring up these issues with your physician, um, have them evaluate for potential reversible causes. Maybe it's a nutritional issue, you just get some pancreatic enzymes and, and then you feel a lot better. Um, maybe you have low thyroid function, or maybe you're low in B12 or iron. Um, now, if you can't find any reversible causes and you're on treatment, one of the best uh, therapies for fatigue is exercise. Um, now it's not that you need to do any kind of strenuous exercise, but even light exercise has been shown to improve fatigue symptoms. So I think we showed some of that uh, data earlier. And lastly, I wanted to discount the importance of your psychological health. Um, it's, uh, everyone has depression, anxiety, stress when you're dealing with cancer and going through treatment. So, uh, and there may be a lot of other factors. You know, right now we have you know, COVID pandemic. Of course, that's going to add more stress. And what's the financial impact uh, of that, of, uh, of what's happening and your family, you're worried about your caregivers. So, uh, you know, I, I would uh, encourage you to seek out help. Uh, organizations like PANCAN, of course, uh, you're already you know, seen this talk through PANCAN, but it's a great organization, a great way to get support, uh, look at support groups. And don't be afraid to reach out to a social worker, psychologist, or psychiatrist uh, for more help. Okay, now I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Uh, we're going to go into the um, integrative realm a little bit. So let's talk about mindfulness. So uh, there's different styles of mindfulness. Uh, you know, if you're uh, a Zen meditator, it's really you're trying to uh, blank your mind. So he says, I never met anyone so thoughtless in my life. Keep up the good work. So because some types of meditation, you're supposed to have no thoughts, right? So that's, that's the uh, joke behind there. So, But mind-body practices are, have been well studied and uh, have level A evidence. Level A evidence indicates that it's had a randomized controlled trial showing its benefits for cancer patients. So it can really help with stress, mood disturbance, um, there's some data that can help with sleep, improve your quality of life. Um, this is one study where they were uh, using a hypnosis approach for patients undergoing a biopsy. And you can see that patients um, both had less pain and less anxiety through the procedure uh, when they use a mind-body technique like hypnosis. Um, there's also been uh, studies, oh, in this, in, in this case, they actually, because the patients were more relaxed, they actually, uh, the length of the procedure was generally shorter than those patients who had standard of care. So you can see they, uh, maybe the, the procedure was somewhere between, you know, 10 to 15 minutes shorter. Um, here's a study where they looked at uh, a trial of yoga for breast cancer survivors, and you can see they had generally improvements in sleep. That's the, the blue um, bar is showing improvements in sleep than those who did not. 
Um, this is Qigong for patients who are undergoing radiation therapy. And the CESD is a depression marker, so generally patients had less depression. Now let's switch gears to acupuncture. Now, um, this is a cartoon, you know, you've got to be kidding, your back still hurts and he's got probably, you know, 100 plus needles. So again, more is not always better. Um, but there is good data that acupuncture can help with things like nausea, pain, uh, fatigue, uh, neuropathy. There's more and more data coming out. This is one of the best studies published in JAMA, um, you know, almost uh, over 20 years ago, where they found that compared to the standard of care, electrical acupuncture decreased the episodes of vomiting by, you know, almost 50, 60 percent in this study. Um, there have been studies of acupuncture for pain management. You can see here on the left, the acupuncture group, the pain scores went from the mid-50s down to the 30s, versus the placebo or the sham acupuncture uh, stayed in the 50 range. This is a study more recently published, uh, 2010, looking at uh, acupuncture for aromatase-induced arthralgia, so joint pain due to the medications um, that are commonly used in breast cancer. And this is a study I found uh, specifically in pancreatic cancer where uh, patients were randomized to electrical acupuncture versus control. And you can see over the week, those patients who got uh, electrical acupuncture had reduced uh, pain versus those who uh, did not. Let's talk a little bit about art therapies like music therapy. This is a uh, KISS if you're a KISS fan. It might be uh, therapeutic. If you're not a KISS fan, it, it may be <laughs> more stressful than therapeutic. Um, but uh, music therapy has been studied as well in cancer and shown really good benefits, again, for stress, anxiety, mood disturbance. Uh, can also help with quality of life and pain. This is a randomized study from our colleagues here, uh, including Dr. Lang, who showed that uh, music therapy intervention was helpful for those women undergoing a breast surgery. You can see here um, the overall improvement in scores versus a control group. Uh, here for uh, actually children undergoing a lumbar puncture, which is a procedure that pulls out the fluid from the spinal column. Uh, and so those who uh, had music therapy had less anxiety uh, and um, less pain than the control group, which you can see there. And lastly, there's some data around foot massages. So a foot massage, uh, if you see this as a foot massage, I, I would be cautious. Um, so uh, here we can see that there's some data around it's helping with stress and anxiety. Uh, pain, even there's some data around constipation, and people are looking at it for neuropathy. One important thing to remember is that uh, for uh, oncology massage, you have to have a, a practitioner that's well-trained and knows how to work with cancer patients so that um, they need to modify their massage techniques so that uh, generally for cancer patients, especially if you're on treatment, uh, level 5 deep pressure massage may not be appropriate and may not be safe. So it may be level 1 through 4 which is more appropriate. And generally, those are the ranges we tend to use for our patients. Um, here's a randomized study of massage to help uh, improve pain and mood. And you can see the uh, massage group did much better um, than those who are just getting uh, standard of care options. Uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering's uh, published data. And you can see here just a single session of uh, massage in the hospital can improve symptoms from 20 to 50 percent with you know, a lot of improvement in pain scores uh, as well as in anxiety. So a lot of benefits with a simple approach rather than, say, using more medicines. Now as the data has improved, uh, there's been uh, updates to guidelines. So this guideline came out about two years ago where they showed that for uh, breast cancer there's been enough data to indicate you know, meditation can be helpful, meditation yoga for stress, for mood, acupuncture for nausea, music therapy. Uh, as well for stress and mood. Um, and other guidelines, like the NCCN, National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines, are starting to incorporate a lot of these integrative approaches like acupuncture. Um, MBSR is mindfulness-based stress reduction, hypnosis, CBT is cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and this is just one example. If you look at the NCCN guidelines for pain, listed on the left side, you see MBSR, imagery, hypnosis, biofeedback, relaxation techniques, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. So, uh, massage is listed on the right, acupuncture. Um, so now you're seeing these national guidelines uh, start to incorporate these types of approaches. And even on the National Cancer Institute website, when they talk about palliative care and the physical domain, uh, they talk about nutrition, deep breathing techniques and such. So I think there's greater uh, recognition that these types of approaches are really helpful. Uh, there's also been a publication, uh, this is for low back pain, you can see there's a, they indicate there's moderate quality of evidence for acupuncture, mindfulness-based stress reduction. There's lower quality evidence, but 
some evidence for yoga, tai chi, and, and similar therapies. So in the last part here, I'm just going to talk about how can we help you uh, build your own a comprehensive uh, treatment plan that includes the support of an integrative uh, component. So again, just a reminder of the different domains of physical, psychological, uh, social, and spiritual. Um, I always tell patients, you know, focus on things that are really natural. So uh, less on um, processed pills and more on nutrition, exercise, mind-body techniques. To me, this is uh, the, probably the most natural options that you can really seek out. Uh, try to have a balanced approach, you know, yin-yang, uh, more is not always better. Uh, think about some small steps, so you don't have to do everything at once, uh, but kind of have a, a, a long-term goal in mind. And then think about the dose and quality, and, and it really should be something you enjoy. Uh, oftentimes I see patients who say, you know, they're you know, drinking asparagus uh, juice or wheatgrass, but they, it tastes horrible. And I say, well, if you don't really like it, you don't have to do it. Um, so I really want want these kind of interventions to be something you enjoy and not something you have to force yourself to do. Um, you really need to assess your needs. Uh, work with your medical team. That's so important is to make sure your medical team knows the things that you're doing. And then set some small goals um, so that uh, you can monitor your own progress. So let's talk about these different domains. Um, for nutrition, it's really focusing on, can you, know, can you make some healthier choices? Uh, look at the quality of foods, you know, how are you eating your foods and how you're cooking them and what's the quantity. So um, that's how I want uh, you to kind of think through your meals. Um, now, with again, with pancreatic cancer patients, especially if you had surgery and you had your pancreas removed, you really got to work with a dietitian to modify your diet uh, so that it's appropriate. Um, but you want to get a balance, right? And uh, you want to think about your fruits and vegetables, proteins, carbohydrates, and limit those processed foods and limit alcohol. That's really important. Uh, because those are all, uh, alcohol can be a risk factor. And again, uh, people often say, well, I can't get enough vitamins through foods, but, you know, natural foods have a lot of vitamins, and the more you have a variety of fruits and vegetables, the better it's going to be. Now, again, if you've had uh, pancreatic surgery, if you had a large bowel resection, uh, you may need to be on some kind of supplementation. So that's why you need to work with your dietitian, and maybe you might need a multivitamin or some kind of protein supplement, uh, especially if you've had surgery. Now, the kind of things you do want to be mindful of is, you know, what's the impact of some of these other foods, processed foods that you might be thinking about. Um, for instance, for myself, I'm a big fan of popcorn, um, but I think if you have popcorn every day, it's it really going to add up. And, and so you have to monitor uh, your kind of processed foods and the snacks. Uh, it's not that you can't have it, uh, but I think you just need to really think carefully and try to balance it out, and moderation is the key. And so maybe you only have a Starbucks uh, cinnamon dolce latte whipped cream, uh, once a week or rather than, you know, uh, five times a, a week. So uh, think carefully about your choices in terms of foods and, and things do, little things do add up. In the physical domain, uh, continue thinking about your physical activity. You may need physical or occupational therapy, especially if you've been through surgery. Um, but think about the American Cancer Society goals. You want to try to get two to three hours of cardiovascular activity. Um, you may want to think about resistance and weight training. Uh, if you've had recent surgery or in treatment, you may may need to be in physical therapy and have someone supervise your, your activity program. And then thinking about, lastly, in kind of psychological, spiritual, um, building from your existing strengths. So if you're very spiritual or religious, you know, a centering prayer can be a great approach. Maybe you've taken yoga classes in the past. It might be something you want to pick up again. Uh, consider something new. You know, uh, it may be uh, helpful for you to see a psychiatrist or psychologist or maybe take a new class. And think about these mind-body approaches and, and practicing them, just like you're exercising on a regular basis. You want to be practicing a mind-body technique uh, on a regular basis. Uh, and then, you know, social health, a lot of patients with cancer may get very isolated and, and prefer to be uh, by themselves, but I really encourage you to stay active, stay involved, uh, consider meeting your social worker. Um, I think support groups are, are a great avenue for patients. It's not for everyone, but it's, it's worth trying, or maybe trying a new hobby, or even volunteering. And this is an example where they uh, did a randomized controlled trial of a psychological intervention uh, in breast cancer uh, patients who finished uh, conventional therapy. And what they did in this uh, intervention was they um, did a support group. They talked about nutrition, exercise, stress management with mind-body techniques. Uh, and so they really um, focused on a comprehensive approach. And you can see, at least in this population, they did show a survival benefit uh, over 10 years later just by doing this kind of uh, uh, you know, comprehensive uh, integrative approach. So I think you can uh, really incorporate all these types of approaches throughout your continuum of care um, from 
you know, when you're early diagnosis uh, to active treatment into survivorship. Um, these uh, types of therapies might be helpful for your care. So in summary, let me uh, uh, kind of finish up here and thinking about your comprehensive care plan, think about those uh, dimensions of physical, psychological, spiritual, and social. Uh, work with your uh, cancer team, it's a, it's a team approach, and focus on those things that can really improve your outcomes, uh, your symptoms, your function, your cancer control. And it really needs to be personalized to your case, so everyone's a little bit different. Um, it needs to be evidence-based and safe for you. So, uh, Lastly, I just want to mention there is the Society for Integrative Oncology. Actually, they were going to have their uh, conference but because of COVID. Uh, it's been delayed a year, uh, but the next conference will be next year in September, um, and it will be uh, in Baltimore, hosted, co-hosted by John Hopkins. So this is an area that's of interest to you. You may want to seek out the Society for Integrative Oncology. They have a lot of great information around this area. So I think that's my last slide, and so I'll, I'll finish there, and then um, I think we might have some time for questions. So. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for a very informative presentation. Um, let's go ahead and jump into the questions since you mentioned that we do have time. So let's start off a bit broad here. And the first question is, how can patients talk to their doctors about other approaches they may be wanting to try? So the question is now how to uh, bring up this topic with your uh, doctor. So um, I think that um, you know, letting them know that you have an interest and you want to do more in your, your cancer care. Um, and, uh, you know, I would, you know, approach the topic. And uh, I think, um, you know, it's because it's a relatively new field, uh, you may get a variety of different answers. <laughs> um, some may not be familiar uh, and, and some may not be as uh, supportive of this area. And, of course, there may be others who are. Um, so I, I would kind of gauge their level of knowledge and experience. And, um, if you're uh, near a, a major cancer center, I think most cancer centers now have an integrative oncology program of some degree. And so uh, if they're not knowledgeable specifically, maybe you might want to ask for a consult, a consultation with somebody who is more knowledgeable. Uh, I think it is important for you to try to seek out somebody uh, who might be part of an academic center. Uh, I do think, uh, as one of my early slides show, there are a lot of quote-unquote integrative centers, but I think these integrative centers are more alternative uh, and not focused on uh, evidence-based approaches. So I think just uh, be cautious and uh, seek out uh, and talk with your physician, um, your, your cancer team to see what, what they're comfortable with and, and if you might be able to get a consultation uh, if you really want to dive uh, into this area a little bit more. Wonderful. Thank you for that answer. Um, and similarly tied into that, where can patients find reliable resources for locating acupuncture, um, other integrative approaches, um, and specialists in their communities? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so um, I think that's an excellent question in terms of some of these practitioners. So uh, I always encourage patients to try to work within your healthcare system. So here uh, at Simon Cancer Center, uh, we work closely with Connor Integrative Health, uh, which provides the integrative services. And so I think trying to find a service that's within your healthcare system um, so that they are have access to your medical records, so they know what kind of treatments you're uh, receiving is really important. Um, so now sometimes that may not be available, and then I would try to see if there's a integrative practitioner who works within a academic center or a major healthcare system. Uh, I think that would be a, a good option, and then check with your acupuncturist, your massage therapist, uh, your practitioner. How experienced are they working with cancer patients? I think that's really critical. Um, because the average patient who might go to a, uh, um, a clinic uh, for acupuncture massage, they're probably uh, healthy. And so they're probably, you know, they, they don't see a lot of patients who are on chemotherapy or who might be on a blood thinner because uh, they had a blood clot or who just had radiation. So having someone who has some experience, I think, is, is helpful if that's available in your area. And then uh, if not, you know, making sure that your cancer team can at least contact their practitioner, uh, make sure there's some communication between the two uh, would be helpful if that's uh, hopefully both parties are open to that. Thank you. Um, you also touched on a few trials or studies assessing obesity. So we had a question um, regarding does obesity contribute to the chances of just acquiring pancreatic cancer or does it make treatment less successful? So I think the data indicates a little bit of both. So there is data that um, patients who um, are obese tend to have a higher risk of developing pancreatic cancer. 
And then there's also data that if you develop pancreatic cancer and then have obesity, your outcomes are going to be worse uh, in terms of your overall survival. So there is data, uh, from what I understand, that it's both a risk factor um, as well as can lead to worse outcomes once you are diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, the next question is, if someone is interested in a natural treatment that is currently in clinical trials, um, for example, vitamin C, but unable to participate within the trial, is there any way to find a local provider who may be willing to administer this treatment? Uh, okay. So, um, yeah, so I, I do get a lot of questions about something like vitamin C. So, um, what I would suggest, I would be very cautious about pursuing these, uh, you know, like uh, as mentioned, these natural treatments um, off a clinical trial. And the reason being that um, when you're on a clinical trial, you're being monitored very carefully, and there's, you know, a lot of uh, regulations around that. Uh, and so I think that would be a safer way. Now, I understand that you may not be able to qualify for that clinical trial. Then I think you really need to talk to your cancer team to figure out if that approach is really the right approach for you. Um, because uh, what I have seen is that some patients will pursue some natural therapies or alternative therapies, uh, and they kind of get lost to the system. And then when they return, say, six months to a year, uh, unfortunately, they might have progressed. Their cancer has become so much worse that um, they're really not eligible for any kind of treatment. So I think if you do pursue uh, any type of these alternative or natural treatments, um, really try to stay in touch with your cancer physician. A lot of these clinics aren't going to order the blood work or CT scans to monitor what's happening or check for side effects. Uh, and that's where I've seen patients run into uh, real trouble. Um, and by the time they get back into uh, traditional conventional care, and uh, it might be a little bit too late. So uh, I would, I would um, communicate with your cancer team and, and uh, uh, just be cautious about pursuing some of these things. Thank you. And similarly tied in, um, if a patient is considering incorporating supplements to their treatment, what do you recommend they do to be best informed about the supplement they're considering? Mm -hmm. So uh, one, I would, um, you know, it's a little bit hard because uh, I know when patients look on the internet, there's so much information. And so it's very easy to get lost in the data. And it's hard to interpret unless you really have a, a scientific background of some sort. So I would encourage you to talk with your cancer team. And then when you bring up the topic, bring the product. So uh, when I see patients for consultation, I ask them to bring all the bottles, all the herbs and supplements that they want to take. Um, part of that is because it says on the front, it says, you know, for instance, you know, I'm just making up, you know, Rich Lee's uh, herbal supplement A. But it doesn't tell you what's really inside of it. So you've got to really look at the label. And so it's really helpful when my patients bring in the bottle so I can actually look at the label and, and understand the ingredients because the name is not always uh, very telling. Um, and then if you have any data, uh, you want to look for clinical trials. A lot of my patients uh, actually had this earlier this week. They said, oh, this you know, product X is being sold, and you know, I heard it's curing people. And I said, well, OK, let's I said, well, I'll, I'll look it up. So we tried to look it up. And then um, actually, when I looked it up, it was sold on Amazon. But then when I went to the company website, you couldn't find it on the company website. So it's very confusing. So actually, I think it might have been a knockoff product of the company. Um, and then we tried to look up the ingredients. We couldn't figure out the ingredients. So um, you know, you, you just have to be really cautious uh, pursuing these kind of things and uh, try to provide as much data for your, your cancer team. So if you are able to find it's based on a clinical trial, uh, bring on that paper if you, you can find that paper. So at least your, your, your team can read about it and understand it. And, uh, and, and be informed so they can figure out what the risks and benefits are and if it's appropriate for your care. That's very helpful. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, the next question is regarding chemotherapy and um, people potentially experiencing very unpleasant tastes um, or bump-like textures inside the mouth. Any suggestions to potentially lessen these conditions? Yes, yeah, so uh, that's very common to have taste changes. Um, and there aren't any really great solutions. So um, there's a little bit of data that uh, taking zinc supplementation might be helpful for some of the taste changes. Um, so oftentimes you, may, you could try, say, 10 milligrams two or three times a day. I actually had a patient try this, and she thought it might have helped a little bit. Uh, but some people, you know, patients try it, and it doesn't really help. Um, uh, so I wish there were more uh, things that you could do. Sometimes I've had patients um, really try to 
uh, instead of tasting it, they try to, you know, say like they're drinking soup or eating soup, they'll just use a straw so that they can drink the soup without having to taste it because it tasted so weird. Um, so I, I think there are some strategies you can try, uh, but that's, that's a, unfortunately a really tough one uh, without a, a, a very good solution to it. No, thank you. Those are great suggestions. Um, we also did have a question in regards to CBD-based therapies. Um, are they effective for potentially treating advanced pancreatic cancer? Yes, so good question. I get this a lot as, as well. It's a hot topic, I think, right now. Um, so I think that, uh, so, you know, when you think about medical cannabis, there's really two main active ingredients uh, that we uh, are aware of. Uh, one is THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, and then there's CBD, uh, which is uh, cannabidiol. Now, um, the CBD, um, you know, it, depending on where you live and in which states, you know, some places do have medical cannabis available. Um, whether or not CBD by itself has any anti-cancer activity, I would say is not really clear, um, or even THC. Now, is it possible it might have anti-cancer activity? Yes, it's possible, uh, and I think there's some preliminary data uh, for, say, like brain cancer, because there are actually CBD receptors, and they're highly prevalent in neurons. So for brain cancers, there's some data that may modulate uh, uh, brain cancers. But in pancreatic cancer, I personally have not come across anything. Uh, we actually had an expert, Donald Abrams, uh, from University of California, San Francisco, come out here, and, and um, he gave a lecture on, he does a lot of research on medical cannabis. And someone asked the same question, is there any anti-cancer effect? And he said basically in his, you know, 30 plus years as a oncologist, and of course in California, it's pretty prevalent. Uh, they have a lot of people using cannabis. He's like, he essentially said, you know, in my 30 years, I've yet to come across a case in which he felt like cannabis actually treated a cancer. And, and so he, he basically was saying that if there was really a, a strong signal for anti-cancer effect, we probably would have seen it given how much medical cannabis is being utilized, especially in California. So um, I think it's helpful for symptom management. Uh, might it be helpful for pain, anxiety? Um, you know, there is FDA-approved uh, THC called uh, dronabinol or Marinol is the trade name, uh, and it's something that your doctor can prescribe, and it's approved for things like nausea. It's approved for appetite stimulation. There's some data that may help with taste changes. So you can actually um, get medical cannabis in any, every state uh, through a prescription of FDA-approved medicines. And then if you're in a state that has medical cannabis available, you could also try that. Uh, but again, I would definitely talk with your uh, cancer doctor about it and make sure they're aware of what you're using uh, just to make sure they're, you know, avoid any interactions and such. So, but I think it's reasonable to use these compounds as a supportive care uh, medicine. Uh, but as an anti-cancer medicine, I, I have my, my doubts, and I, I think only in brain cancer do I feel there's enough data to, to really pursue further research. Thank you for that valuable insight. Um, and at this time, we do have um, time for one last question. Um, so are there any proven natural remedies for neuropathy or ways to alleviate um, symptoms? No, there are, yes, so I'm, I'm actually very interested in neuropathy. Um, so in terms of natural, so say herbs or supplements, um, there hasn't been a lot of uh, data. You know, there was a study where they were looking at it. I think uh, they used L-carnitine, and it actually uh, may have worsened the symptoms. Um, I know people are looking at CBD or THC, so I think that's being studied, but it's, it's not really clear how much it may help with chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy. There is growing data that acupuncture may help with the treatment of um, chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy. So I think that's something worthwhile trying. Uh, I will say that it's, uh, I usually tell patients um, that, it, you know, if you're on chemotherapy, make sure you tell your physician because they need to dose adjust because you, you don't want the symptoms to become uh, permanent um, and you want to catch those symptoms early before they become permanent. And then two, uh, after you stop chemotherapy, the symptoms often get better uh, in the first three to six months. So Often time will help. Um, now, if you, if you do have symptoms and they're chronic and severe, um, a lot of the medicines that we use for neuropathy have actually very few side effects. So, um, uh, you know, simple things like gabapentin or uh, duloxetine, I think, um, can be utilized and, and, and have relatively few side effects, especially compared to chemotherapy. So I think it's really uh, reasonable to try some of these things first, uh, but acupuncture would be uh, something you could try. Uh, and then, you know, 
uh, we'll have to keep an eye out for more uh, clinical trials on use of things like CBD or THC. Thank you again, Dr. Lee, for all of your very helpful answers. We would like to thank you again for your informative presentation. The PowerPoint slides and a recording of this webinar will be available at pancan.org under the educational events page. And there may be a delay of several days before the information is posted, but your patience is appreciated. Once again, we would like to thank our webinar sponsors, AstraZeneca and Ipsen, and our scientific and medical affairs industry members, Abvi, Angiodynamics, AstraZeneca, Ipsen, Pfizer, Raphael Pharmaceuticals, Tempus, Trisalis, and Time. A survey will pop up once you leave the session today, so please take a moment to share your feedback. If you have questions or would like to receive a free supportive care booklet, please contact Patient Central at 877-2-PANCAN and ask to speak with the case manager. This concludes the webinar. Thank you. Thank you.